Uh, hi, I'm Lauren. I'm a software engineer at the Guild, an open source software engineer. You can find me on Twitter and GitHub, maybe also on LinkedIn. And today I'm going to talk about uh, leveraging GraphQL for building public APIs. Uh, first of all, disclaimer, this is not a talk about REST, TRPC, GRPC versus GraphQL over HTTP. We all know that Twitter is the right place for this debate. Uh, so instead, I'm going to talk about why developers love GraphQL and then also about the challenges in uh, using GraphQL for building a public API. So the first benefit of GraphQL, of course, is no versioning. That means you have a, a schema, and if you have a field, for example, here, an address, and in the future you want to expose the address in a different format, you can just add more fields to the existing schema without breaking existing clients. So the clients can then later on just update their operations when they're ready for it. So as a server developer, you can just uh, add new features, as you want, and the client developers can adapt uh, as they want. Then the other obvious benefit is uh, that you can only fetch what you need. So if I only need the country name of a certain user, I can certainly craft a query for doing so. And if I need more information, I can update a query for only getting that information as well. And then the, uh, another benefit is the strongly typed uh, GraphQL schema. So we have object types, interfaces, enums, unions, and a convenient SDL for actually modeling the schema. So on the right here we have a person who, which has certain properties and, or, uh, and a query root type for actually fetching the uh, person. And we can make sure that our GraphQL server will validate the data that is fetched behind the scenes. And in case like the application layer or the server layer would resolve to wrong data, the error would be handled by the GraphQL engine instead of the client uh, being responsible for handling it. And uh, here's uh, actually something I would consider an anti-pattern because what we often see with uh, GraphQL is that people, uh, like on the left, we have a database schema, it's a Prisma schema if you're famili familiar with it. And what people often do is just one-to-one -one map their database schema to their uh, uh, GraphQL schema. And I think it's not a good idea. Why? Uh, let me show you. So here you can see that, uh, oh, maybe I should go into detail first. Like uh, Here we're modeling uh, a task, and the task has four states, which are described by the EMUM. They're waiting, processing, done, and failed. And then on the task, we actually have properties that are related to each of those phases uh, the task might be in. So if we can, in the first picture, we can see that uh, the waiting state is related to the created at field. In the second one, uh, when the task shifts to processing, we also have a process at property. But because uh, the property was already there in the, ta is in the task in the, in the waiting state, we in GraphQL, if you would model your schema like this, you would have to uh, model the process at field as nullable, uh, which is uh, depicted by not adding an exclamation mark at the end. And that means even when we're in the processing state, the field is still nullable. So as someone who's consuming this GraphQL schema, I still have to do strict null checks for accessing this field, even though I know that it is there when the task is in the processing state. And the same then applies for the further stages, like the failed stage, where we have a finished add, an error code, and an error reason field, and also for the done status, when we have finished add and result field. So what you can do instead in GraphQL is leverage uh, interfaces for modeling your data in a better way for the, for the uh, client. So instead, we will use an interface and then have uh, five types, or uh, four types, that actually implement the interface. And each of those types then has the specific properties for that phase. And that allows you, as a client developer, for just checking the type name of the actual uh, object we got back and then from there more, uh, access the properties without having to add exhaustive null checks. So then another big benefit of GraphQL is the superior developer experience, uh, experience through all the tooling that is available today. So uh, the first one that comes to my mind is the GraphQL IDE, which basically uh, is based on the, one of the best features of GraphQL, which is introspection. So you just give it your GraphQL endpoint, and it will just inspect it and give you a full documentation 
of your GraphQL API and you can build your queries, get auto-completes. Uh, this is just superior for client developers because even if they don't have a lot of experience with GraphQL, they can just play around with that and start fetching some data and then move on to the applications and implement, implement it. Uh, the next thing which uh, I also leveraged before is uh, generating docs from your GraphQL schema. This is also based on uh, introspection. It's very similar to what uh, Graphical does, but in my experience, uh, especially for like big enterprise companies, they always want uh, also a dedicated documentation where everything is has its own page. Uh, and then another awesome tooling thing, which uh, I'm also biased about because I maintain it, is that you can generate code from GraphQL inspection. So you can uh, write your GraphQL uh, queries or fragments next to your component code and then in that code only select uh, the data that you actually need for displaying this code, uh, displaying a certain component or UI component. And then later on in a build step, Compose that to up to a single query. So if you have a certain view on your page, all of that will be uh, fetched within a single server round trip. And yeah, also the components are reusable because you can uh, use the fragments on different queries and you can even compose those uh, uh, fragments together uh, or those components that consume fragments. So with uh, great power <laughs> comes great responsibility. There's obviously a lot of challenging, uh, challenges when uh, uh, hosting a GraphQL API. Some of them I'm going through today. Uh, first of all, GraphQL was not designed to be exposed to the public internet. That might not be obvious to everyone, but uh, all those companies use uh, GraphQL, but neither of us ever did a real uh, GraphQL or arbitrary GraphQL request to any of their services. Why? Because they only use a GraphQL, uh, a GraphQL API where you can send any query in development. Like in production, they gather all the operations or queries that are in the application code, extract them, and then only allow those operations to be actually executed. Uh, this practice is uh, often referred to as persistent operations. And then only those operations can actually be executed from the public internet. Uh, what most people actually do when they're building GraphQL API, API, whether it's public or private, is they will just expose the GraphQL API to the public internet, which, as we just saw, uh, might not be the best idea because you get DDoS very soon. Um, yeah, but then we also have companies like Shopify and GitHub, and they have a public GraphQL API. But why are they not getting DDoS? Yes, they have a lot of engineers that are preventing that, but also they are doing certain measures for solving that. Uh, so the question here is where should we put security measures? Like when you're building a GraphQL API where you want to allow uh, executing arbitrary GraphQL queries because you don't know the clients that well. So there's two options uh, in front of the GraphQL API or instead uh, in front of the databases and other services that are called by the GraphQL API. And uh, the quick answer is both. <laughs> because uh, when you're using GraphQL, as you might already notice, you're exposing a very sensible interface to the internet. So in addition to your normal security of your already existing service, like uh, checking uh, whether the viewer is allowed to access certain data and stuff like that, you now also need to secure your GraphQL API. So let's uh, have a look at what can actually cause a bottleneck or could be uh, an issue in a GraphQL engine. So we obviously have a client that sends an HTTP request to a server and then the server will process that uh, HTTP request. So, and what's happening in the GraphQL engine is that there's three mandatory phases. First is parsing, then validating, and execution. I will go into details uh, about those phases now. So, GraphQL APIs are vulnerable by default 
because uh, there's a complex parsing process for documents. So when you send a GraphQL operation to the server, it first needs to be tra uh, translated to something the server can actually work with for later on resolving the data. Then after the document is parsed, we need a validation process for those documents in order to make sure that it's uh, eligible for being executed. Like there could be ref fields referenced that are uh, not existing. And then, yeah, as I already said, we can execute arbitrary documents. Uh, they can be potentially very huge or like trying to uh, DDoS the server. And then bound to that, there's that we have a complex data loading process. We are not loading like one entity. We're loading many. So what uh, the uh, companies like Facebook uh, and Cole are doing is that they are using persistent document security. So what they can uh, actually do is completely skip the parsing and validation of GraphQL ex ex uh, documents at runtime, because they can that beforehand at build time when they actually build the application. And then even even though probably not a lot of them doing this, there's even the uh, idea that you can create an execution plan in advance and even optimize further on top of that. One uh, example of that is GraphQL JIT if you're familiar with Node.js. So for validation and parsing, you definitely want to consider having a cache. Like you can't cache everything, so you need to use an LRU cache. So here we have the query that is then uh, converted into an abstract syntax tree, which is then later on used by the GraphQL engine. So the same applies for validation. After, after we get the AST, the AST is actually used for the validation. It's checked against the GraphQL schema. And that's, again, might be a bottleneck if you get a lot of GraphQL requests. So what you can uh, quick win there is to also add an LRU cache. Mm, and the, the last step is the execution. And even there, you can apply caching for reducing your load. You can uh, uh, leverage the graph incoming GraphQL payload, which contains usually a query and variables, and the auto uh, auto authorization header for constructing a cache key. And with this con uh, cache key, you can then uh, cache the result of a GraphQL execution, and upon a second execution, serve the result directly from the cache instead of like doing the whole uh, expensive thing again. You can either cache the stuff in memory or Redis, depending on what your needs. Uh, there's a, uh, in a, right now, there's multiple solutions for doing the latter. Uh, there's like SAS software, like Stellate, but also we are maintaining GraphQL Yoga version 3, which is a JavaScript server that runs on any platform, which also supports this. And then the last thing is we can optimize the engine, but at some time uh, we can't do stuff because people are sending too deep queries. So in REST style APIs, we always had clearly separated endpoints. In GraphQL APIs, we only have one endpoint. So, and as you can see, like a deeply nested query can be dangerous, especially in this example where we have me query which fetches a single user, and then for each for the user we select the friends and then of those friends, we select the friends, and so on, and so on, and uh, it will grow exponentially, uh, ultimately killing the server. So a quick win here would be to just apply death limit. Say, okay, if the query is, has a death limit of eight or greater, we will just reject it and not execute it at all. But it is hard to find a sweet spot here, because we don't know how expensive a field is actually before executing it or without schema knowledge. For example, a best friend field would only always resolve to one more entity, where a friend's field would always resolve to many entities. So just having a depth limit, that's an arbitrary number, might not be a great idea. Another thing we could do is look at the tokens in a GraphQL query, and then say, okay, if there's more than and tokens will just reject the query. Obviously, that's also kind of has the same drawbacks as the uh, previous approach. And then another approach that's also very popular is query complexity analysis, where you just give a score to each uh, field and then calculate the total score. And if it exceeds a certain limit, 
just reject uh, the operation. Uh, the, the great guys from Escape Tech have a solution for that if you're working with GraphQL JS. Uh, I hope they will talk more about this in detail uh, in the next talk. And the next thing then is how do we find a sane security defaults? Like we at the Guild, we developed a tool which is called GraphQL Inspector. You can just uh, use it against your existing operations and then uh, analyze what's the general depth alias alias count, directive count, and token count in those operations, and then set your um, GraphQL server to those defaults. But if you don't own the API, you might not even know what kind of GraphQL operations you're getting, right? So it will be hard to find any same defaults. Uh, uh, yeah, another solution you could also instead do is uh, annotate your GraphQL schema with uh, custom directives um, and implement custom logic based on that, but it's very sp uh, ap uh, application logic specific and that point it might even make sense to instead just do it within uh, the resolvers of your GraphQL schema and not as a security thing in front of it. So yeah, um, when we're evolving a GraphQL schema we have uh, certain issues. First of all, a single endpoint makes tracking the usage harder. We don't know what fields are used. Uh, we, we don't know when we can remove a field. We don't know which fields are slow. And uh, we also don't know what is the actual query depth and query complexity score used by API users. So that obviously opens a room for having a GraphQL API specific tooling, uh, which we at the Guild built, which is called GraphQL Live. So GraphQL Live is uh, a platform for uh, pushing your GraphQL schemas and then uh, configuring your servers to send usage data to, uh, to GraphQL Hive. And based on that, we can give you uh, analytics on how your GraphQL schema is used, which clients select which fields, and when it's safe to remove a field. Uh, for example, you ca could set a threshold, okay, if uh, only 0.001% of API users uh, select uh, or request a certain GraphQL field, it's safe to remove it because the usage is not that high. And then also, if we are starting to use GraphQL, uh, we might have uh, other data sources already. So what people do with GraphQL is aim for a single source of truth and not have like multiple GraphQL APIs. So introducing GraphQL into an existing environment where there might be REST APIs, other databases, could be hard. And this is why we developed GraphQL Mesh. The Uri will talk more about this uh, later on. So GraphQL Mesh has ex uh, basically helps you uh, converting existing APIs into uh, a GraphQL API and composing them. So then there's also the question of maybe someone is already using GraphQL for private applications because uh, GraphQL is by the, like the, the main idea of GraphQL was to power, power UI views. But as your application uh, or your business evolves, you might want to open your API also for external users, uh, which is also something I encountered before. So you first you have your UI uh, clients and later on you actually have server clients, uh, public APIs. So what you can do there is uh, either build a completely new GraphQL API from scratch that shares some functionalities with the existing API that you already have that is private, or what you can instead leverage is uh, filtering your existing private uh, API into a public API, uh, for example, by having custom logic that looks at directives that are on your uh, schema definitions, and then instead, depending on who is accessing the API, you serve the correct schema. Yeah, uh, what is obvious is that GraphQL is here to stay. Um, more and more companies are adopting GraphQL. Uh, public APIs become more common. Covert uh, API as a service. Graph uh, GraphQL obviously has a lot of benefits for API users. But also GraphQL introduces new challenges for API maintainers and builders. 
But I think there will be a lot of opportunity for new ideas that will change how things are today. Uh, thank you. If you have any questions about uh, Craft Girl Hive, ask me. Um, I also have stickers if you want stickers of the, <laughs> uh, uh, the Guild uh, open source projects. Thank you.